What's up, everyone? Uh, my name is Camila Cabello, and I'm so excited and honored to be here today with youth climate justice activists Shia Bastida and Jerome Foster to learn more about their work and why we're facing such an important moment to protect our mama earth. Right now, leaders from across the world, including youth and frontline activists, are coming together to demand urgent and more ambitious action to fight climate change. Many of them are gathering at COP26, the United Nations 26th Annual Climate Change Conference, which is happening right now in Glasgow, Scotland. That's my really bad Scottish accent. Basically, this global conference is a place for leaders from all over the world to come together to make bold commitments to address the climate crisis. Last year, COP was postponed because of COVID-19, which means there weren't as many opportunities for countries to come together and negotiate bigger and bolder climate action, which we really need. While last year's conference may have been postponed, there's no denying that the climate crisis is here and it's gonna affect every single one of us if we don't take hold of this once in a generation opportunity to create real solutions and honestly, a more beautiful world where we live in harmony and live with nature. We have to hold world leaders accountable to deliver on their commitments, urge them to be more ambitious and protect the communities that are most impacted by climate change. This planet is our home, our only one. And it's our responsibility to use our voices to protect it. Each and every one of us has the ability to create change. I know it can be overwhelming to figure out where to start, but our collective action makes a big difference. And that's why I'm so excited to be joined here today for a conversation with a couple of my personal heroes who have been on the front lines day in and day out fighting for climate justice. Shia Bastida and Jerome Foster Thank you guys so much for being here. I'm so excited to speak with you. Thank, Thank you for having you us. us. Well, guys, um, I want to dive right in. Uh, we know that climate change is here and already impacting people across the globe. With COP26 happening right now, people are demanding action from world leaders. Um, so what does that really mean? You know, what are we demanding and how can we be sure leaders are hearing us? Jerome, I want to start with you. Yeah, absolutely. So as we go into COP26, there's a real urge both on the national scale with the U.S., but also on the international scale. Really what we're advocating for is for one, the end of subsidies to the fossil fuel industry and using just like public dollars to make coal and oil artificially cheaper when solar and wind are, solar and wind are actually like the cheapest form of energy already mm. across the globe. Wow. So that's our first demand. And also what we're also demanding is a prioritization of youth and frontline communities at the table when we're making these mm -hmm. decisions. Everywhere we look across the globe, whenever we have a diversity of thought and perspectives, whether that's in the boardroom or whether that's in um, community um, discussions, when we have um, frontline communities, indigenous people, um, people yeah. of color, they're showing their perspective and saying, hey, this is how we have lived across the world and in, in, in our ways, and you can mm -hmm. use our knowledge to better solutions. So that's our second demand. And third demand is to stop the construction of um, coal, um, coal fire power mm -hmm. plants, and also pipelines that go through indigenous communities. So that's our three main demands, but there's a plethora of other um, solutions that we're advocating for as we lead into COP. I love to hear you lay it out like that because I feel like so many people are overwhelmed by the climate crisis and are like, we, you know, we need our politicians to do better, but we, it's so good to be aware of what exactly we're asking for, like ex like the actual instructions for what we need to be demanding. And, you know, segueing into what you were saying about needing to have youth and indigenous communities and BIPOC, BIPOC communities at the table because they are the ones that are the most impacted. Um, Shia, I want to take it to you and ask you, can you share with us who will be the most impacted by the climate crisis and what message you're bringing to COP on behalf of Nuestro México Lindo Querido, um, a country that is so deeply rooted in culture and indigenous wisdom. Speaking of, I was actually just, I just came back from Oaxaca um, two days ago, which is a state that is 60% uh, indigenous and uh, spent a lot of time with people there. And it's so beautiful. I loved Chi and your TED Talk, how you talk about how, you know, sometimes it can be made to seem as if you know, the climate crisis is happening because you're not taking your reusable bag to the grocery store. Um, when actually it's like collective action and bigger messages that start even in our relationship to nature and our symbiosis with nature and how, 
it would be so incredible. I'm kind of going on a tangent here. If, you know, in school we were taught the, the beauty and the importance of a reverence for nature and taking care of our planet as being part of our humanity. Um, but anyway, back to my first question, what communities are going to be the most affected and what message are you bringing to COP on behalf of Mexico? Well, we see that communities are already being affected by the climate crisis, and it's mainly black and brown frontline communities, indigenous mm -hmm. communities. Uh, Jerome touched upon this, but pipelines primarily go through indigenous land. Uh, in Mexico, a lot of um, mines uh, are actually in, in indigenous territory, and we see that the most of the contamination from uh, waste facilities, contamination from uh, electricity gener generators, uh, are all located in black and brown communities. And wow. for example, in New York City, 17% um, of adults in the Bronx have asthma, which is 10% higher wow. than the national average. So we have this problem of environmental racism and environmental injustice that we have mm -hmm. to deal with. That's why we talk about climate justice and mm. people don't really know what climate justice uh, entails. We, we say it a lot, but what it really means is that the climate crisis exacerbates all other injustices. So if right. indigenous peoples are already marginalized, this is gonna marginalize them even more. And it's actually harming their lands, harming our traditions, harming our culture. You mentioned going to Oaxaca and I'm from uh, near Toluca. And mm -hmm. you know, when land is lost, when the effects of the climate crisis hit your home, you lose culture and you lose wow. uh, a part of yourself. And I think people don't really in, like know how much that means to us. Um, so our message is to include these communities at the decision-making tables. In Paris, uh, in the Paris Agreement, we got the 1.5 degree target instead of the two degree target of warming because island nations were represented because at two degrees, they're gonna be underwater. So that really shows you the importance of including frontline communities and youth have to be included because this is a generational injustice. So we bring, uh, we represent the future at these conferences. Mm, that is such a great point because I feel like in mainstream conversations, you hear a lot about uh, the climate crisis, like just the earth is getting hotter, the earth is getting hotter. And people maybe necessarily, some people don't feel it in their immediate reality, but they don't realize that they actually, everybody is affected by it because it is at the center of so many other kind of injustices. Environmental racism, like you said, I think that's a really great point. And speaking to what you were saying about um, these communities that are being most affected, like black and brown indigenous communities, and such a great point, the youth, because it's a generational injustice, we are gonna have to be carrying this and our children and our children after that. Jerome, you are the youngest climate advisor for the Biden administration and a truly incredible example of a young person carving a seat at the table for themselves. What is possible when young people are included in this conversation and why is, why are, why is that so important? Why is it so important for the youth to be involved? When we have young people that are part of discussions like this, it, especially when we're at like the White House or in congressional offices, it creates like a framework for us to have more deep conversations and nuanced conversations about longevity of solutions and not just the urgency of taking any action possible. Like oftentimes when we talk about climate mm -hmm. solutions, especially when it comes into just Right now, we're thinking of, oh, what, whether we just overturn one pipeline, that's not the goal. It's to stop right. all future pipelines and make sure that we have a, a status quo that isn't just reversed when we have an, another person in office. And I think also when we have young people in, in power, it shows that this isn't just an old person issue. This isn't just a young person issue, but it's intergenerational discussion. Mm -hmm. And we have to create policies that not only prioritize the past, but also prepares us for the future most adequately, not just in the the sense of technology, but in the sense of equity, because there's mm. a Native American proverb that says that we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, but we mm. borrow it from our children. And when we are asking wow. to borrow it, we have to consult young people. We have to say, hey, what is the future that you're going to go um, live into? What do you want from it? And mm -hmm. really what we want is the same access to clean air and clean water and that promised land that Dr. King um, advocated mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. That promised land doesn't just go to racial injustice. It goes to the very foundation of how we create policies. And there has been so many cases of young people, especially in California, with the creation of a youth advisory council that basically when they had young people, Indian, Indian folks, um, indigenous folks come together and talk about wildfires, they had a plethora of solutions that said, hey, 
Mm-hmm. So let's tap into that indigenous knowledge and let's mm-hmm. tap into the young people that have been fighting for climate and include that in how we're going to tackle wildfires next year. And if they mm-hmm. had never had young people at that table, they'd never have known about those solutions. Mm. One of my favorite books talking about indigenous wisdom, a book that's changed my life, is called Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, I don't know if you guys have read it, but it is, it, it's so beautiful and has so much. I also remember reading an article in which I think in New Zealand, um, the Maori people, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I think they, uh, you know, it was a similar thing where they were finding solutions because these people have been living and co uh, existing and living in harmony and in symbiosis with their land for so long. And we really have a lot to learn. Um, Mm. Another question for you guys, mobilization is central to both of your climate activism, mobilization of people, of voices, of votes. Um, And we're seeing our generation mobilize in mass numbers right now at COP26. What's going to be your collective call to action and how can we better support you and the movement? Well, we're actually planning a strike on November 5th. Uh, that is not only going to be, obviously, it's going to be really big in Glasgow, but we are uh, organizing it worldwide. It's going to be a global climate strike. And we're also supporting the strike that is being organized by a Glasgow coalition uh, on November 6th. So, you know, just looking at history, we see that direct action that people on the streets is one of the most powerful ways to make people to pay attention to us, mm-hmm. and especially with youth. We are disrupting our civic duty of going to school to call on yeah. on pay attention to us. So that is just the only thing that we have because we can't vote. We can't. We are not included in these tables. So uh, that's why we uh, strike in the first place. But I think it also uh, generates a sense of community. So we invite everyone to join us on both the November fifth and November sixth uh, strikes that are going to happen mm. for climate justice. Something that I was going to say, I was like. I was going to say something and then I forgot and then I was trying to chase it. And now I remember, I think that something that I love about your guys work is that I think that you have this message of, you know, both things are true. We are in a moment where it's about to be the damage that we are going to cause is going to be irreversible. And so it's really, you know, it is like a very, there's an urgency to the moment, but there's also a lot of optimism in the fact that, we, you know, live life day by day. We don't realize that over the course of, of hundreds and, and thousands of years, we really create the narrative. Like humans really shape the narrative. And I think that's why youth, you know, being so important to this conversation is that over time, that's how humanity and civilizations were built. Like nobody had the instruction book. We kind of like wrote it and made it along the way. Um, and I think if that's po- if what we've done now is possible, it's completely possible to shift to a culture where it's, you know, it's sustainable, but also regenerative where, and this is what ties into um, the book Braiding Sweetgrass is that living in symbiosis and in connection with nature is better for all of us. It's better for our, our minds, our, our spirit, our soul, our body. It's not just like, oh, you know, so that my grandchildren are okay. That's maybe hard to feel like in the moment. It's really, you know, it's just a way of, I think, feeling less alone and and more connected to the world because we're not just, you know, protecting nature. We are nature. Mm -hmm. Um, And so anyway, that's just like something that I just wanted to get off my chest Um, because I think it's, yeah, no, I think that's important to to talk about too. Um, Wait, actually, I have a question about your last question. What if we're not, for example, there in person? What? How do we, for example, in Miami right now, where I am, if there's like, if there's not like a strike, is there, uh, should I be organizing one? Should I be posting on social media? When I call my politicians and I, you know, call them, uh, when I call these lines to kind of ask politicians to to take action, what should I be saying? You know what I mean? Like, what should we be doing? What are a few different ways that we can be involved? Sure, yeah. So there's like the policy breakdown. Like over the past couple of weeks, we've been trying to pass an uh, infrastructure bill on climate. And on Thursday, Biden has unveiled that um, with a $1.75 trillion infrastructure bill, which has about half a trillion just designated for climate justice. So that is like a bill that's already been put in place. So really what's next is for us to continue to push for even more policies that weren't included in this bill. 
And right. for example, what that really is, is like advocating for the Green New Deal and advocating mm-hmm. for the, for the um, in, in Polluters Welfare Act. Those two bills will be transformative. So that's really what, like, if you call a member of Congress, those two bills would be amazing. But if you're in a local community, um, just if you aren't in Glasgow physically, or if you aren't comfortable going outside, there's an organization called Fridays for, Fridays for Future USA, and they mm-hmm. have local chapters all across the United States. Okay. So you can get in touch, organize in your community, go out to your local um, capital district or, or anywhere that you feel is like a statement mm. that you can make and make your voice heard. Mm. And I feel like for people that are hesitant to kind of uh, get involved in this conversation because it feels kind of daunting or it feels bleak or they read the headlines, you know, uh, basically we're screwed, Um, (laughs) which we're not. But when people read these headlines, um, it can be kind of hard to remain optimistic about our future. Uh, Chia, in your TED Talk, you mentioned that since you were a child, your family invited you to love the world. And Jerome, I read that despite this challenging task ahead, you remain hopeful. And we were talking about optimism before. In the face of all that's going on, what makes you both optimistic? Chia, let's start with you. Yeah, so I do bring this view and I tell people we have to be stubborn optimists in our fight for climate justice because we are building a better world. We are, uh, you know, trying to protect joy at the end of the day. And if we, this is the work that we're going to be doing for the rest of our lives. We might as well make it enjoyable. And there's something my dad says that really, you know, resonates with me, which is we don't have to live from the earth. We have to live with the earth. And Mm -hmm. once you live with the earth and you recognize the beauty of the earth and the beauty of togetherness, I think that really makes you feel like you're grounded in the decisions that you make. And optimism is, you know, really um, that lens with which innovation and creativity become possible. Because we're still Mm -hmm. talking about if it's real or not, when in reality, we should be talking about what is the world we can build? Um, What is it? you know, the the world we want to create. So that is how I uh, stay optimistic and also just with community. And Jerome is such a big part mm-hmm. of that community. So I'm mm. so grateful to him and everyone in the movement. That's awesome. And Jerome, what about you? Yeah, I'd say that I'm optimistic about a lot of different things. One is about this next decade of just massive action, like of having yeah. like, not just like organizers, but celebrities like yourself and like, people in communities coming together and saying, hey, what do we want this future to look like? What yeah. do we want our planet to envision? And how can our ideals not just be like intangible or saying, oh, I love this tree or I love the, this planet and it's priceless, but actually making it tangible in everything that we do from our society to our economy, to our culture, being rooted in the, in the ideology of, of sustainability and, and really as he always talks about reciprocity. And Mm -hmm. that is really crucial in how we move forward. And that's what I'm optimistic about is also just getting new elected officials that will bring Mm -hmm. this this to to fruition. Like in 2020, a lot of people don't know that like young people made up one every five vote. That's powerful. Like literally before then we made up like less than 10%. And -hmm. politicians are like, wait, something's changing. The politics of the world is changing. And it's because young people are here. And that's what I'm optimistic about is that generational Mm -hmm. change of, prioritizing not just adults, but also prioritizing youth in in the future. Totally. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think that what makes me optimistic as well is like we were talking about before, it's like our grandparents, our great grandparents in hundreds of years and in generations, humanity has changed and evolved so much, you know? So it's like, even if the immediate uh, reality looks a certain way, we can literally, because it has been done, we can create the world that we want to see. The narrative is really in our hands. And I feel really excited. Like I really do. I feel excited when I, you know, read a book like Braiding Sweetgrass and I deepen my own connection with nature, which, you know, talking about, for example, uh, mental health, uh, which is something I'm really passionate about too. Like, connecting with nature and feeling, you know, and and even just spending time outside and connecting with animals. And it's just like, we are a part of such a gorgeous world. And I think that, you know, sometimes modern society can make us forget that and can make us forget that what we're fighting for is so precious. Um, And I think that that makes me really hopeful and, and makes me really excited about 
creating a world that our parents haven't seen, our grandparents haven't seen, a world where it's like she says, it's a world of reciprocity where we have respect for other living things. And we are so, our souls are rich because of that. Jerome, she, I thank you both so much for joining me and for sharing your insights. I feel like I've learned so much from this conversation and I feel like other people will too. And I also feel really inspired. You know, it, it can be overwhelming to hear, but the reality is that the climate crisis will affect us all and generations to come. But hope isn't lost. This is about saving our planet and our futures and honestly creating a more beautiful world uh, and really taking charge of our narrative. If you're looking for ways to take action, I'm going to encourage all of you to join us and use your social media platforms this week, especially while world leaders are together at COP26 to demand more ambitious climate commitments, real commitments that can be delivered by our leaders with equity, collaboration, and urgency. If you're looking for what to say or share, start by following Shi Ye, Jerome, and other youth activists on the front lines and resharing their messages. You can also access resources like the UN's Act Now platform which will give you quick ways to understand and deepen your individual impact. We all have the power to come together in this moment and help move us towards a better and more beautiful future. Thank you so much, Shia and Jerome, and thank you guys all so much for listening in.